and I'm not actually a real expert expert in whiplash. Um, I've treated like hundreds of whiplashes obviously over the years um, and um, but I was asked to do this talk because the real expert couldn't make it so um, he's a good colleague of mine um, and uh, I will explain a little bit more in a second so I'll just share my screen with you um, and hopefully that will work actually that's not going to work I don't think you can share my screen yet um, so let's just share my screen okay Good. Can everyone see the screen quite clearly? If you can't, yeah. So, uh, rehab of whiplash injury. Um, I have been very lucky to get involved with a guy called Chris Wersfold, who is probably the one of the UK's top um, physiotherapists in whiplash. And I may even be able to see if he can come on the um, on to, to speak to us live at some point. He's an extremely busy guy. Uh, he works in Kent and he's sort of he does a lot of things. He represents the CSB who advise government on whiplash. He has consulted for McLaren and he has created some amazing functional exercises um, to um, uh, to support rehabilitation on whiplash. Um, and he supported uh, this, this presentation and also thanks Kathy Davis who is one of our students on two cohorts ago and Kathy helped me prepare the presentation. Um, Chris Wersfold has a great website and you can sign up to his blog um, and he has an amazing um, uh, paper out called um, Functional Rehabilitation of the Neck. I can really recommend it. Um, it was released last year. It's an excellent read, and it's one of a few research paper that re few research papers that really clearly go through rehabilitation exercises. And I find it really frustrating when you read research papers and it's not very clear how to do the exercises. Um, so you can follow Chris on Twitter uh, at Chris Worsfold One uh, and his website's www.chriswersfold.com. Uh, my experience, well, you all know me, so I'm not going to bore you with that. Um, so whiplash associated disorders. So whiplash is the mechanism. It's, it's, it's the actual action. Um, and then the disorder or the associated disorder or disorders, um, because it can cause multiple problems, is the, uh, is the action of, of the, the result of the mechanism of the injury. So it's the result of the mechanism of the whiplash. Um, so it's, it's a sudden um, acceleration, deceleration. Um, it's often low speed. Um, motor vehicle accidents, of course, sometimes they're, 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 they're major accidents, motorway accidents, and people getting cut out of cars, but usually a low speed rear end accidents. Um, they can be due to any collision, so often sports, falls from horses, um, diving, etc., rugby, um, and multiple tissues can be affected. So it, it can be ligaments and muscles and, and tendons and, and discs and facet joint inflammation, um, nerve, nerve root um, impingement. Um, so, you know, this shows the sort of extension, hyperextension, hyperflexion sort of injury that tends to, you know, tends to cause this inflammation on the facet joint and this ligament um, sprain um, that occurs from, from a forceful injury. Um, so key facts. Um, it's the fourth most common MSK disorder worldwide. And um, there's about 600 and 10,000 um, reported whiplashes in the UK each year. Um, it's uh, women at more risk, possibly due to um, increased mobility, um, but we're not sure exactly why. Uh, a lot of the injuries occur in 18 to 25 year olds. Um, and that may be due to the increase in, um, in, in that age group to have accidents. Uh, there's an established link with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think we'll all be familiar with those patients that don't get better. Um, and I'll come on to that uh, in a minute. And that um, goes on to the poor recovery rates. So 40% recover within 12 weeks, but 50% of people continue to experience pain beyond 12 months. That's an alarming amount of people. 
that have ongoing problems post 12 months. Um, 51% of people who reported um, reported whiplash associated disorder following a road traffic accident um, between 2017 and 2019. Uh, the neck, it's pretty awesome. It supports the head. Um, the head weighs typically around 8% of body weight. Um, so anywhere around five, six, seven kilos. Um, it's very mobile. Um, and the neck actually does about 600 movements per hour, um, which, is, um, which is pretty impressive. Let me just see if I'm um, hopefully that is recording. OK, I'm sure that's recording. OK. Um, so obviously it contains all the major uh, sense organs. Now the neck functionally is really designed um, and I always think it was evolutionary. It's designed um, to support our sense organs. So it's designed to support our eyes. It's designed to allow us a good range of vision. So um, so we can see in wide um, in, in wide arcs. It's designed to keep all the sense organs on a stable level. And you'll notice one thing about the neck is as soon as you tilt your head slightly, it's, a, it's very hard to actually function. So the neck is very much due, is very um, um, much a process of keeping all the sense organs level, the roof of the mouth, the, the nose, the, the brain, the eyes. Um, and as soon as you tilt it or it becomes um, um, slightly uh, um, side flex in such cases such as torticollis then uh, then you lose a lot of function um, often uh, you, you know you, you struggle with walking at good speed and you sort of bump into things um, it's um, so there's an excessive tensile stress on the soft tissues um, and um, you often find that muscle spindles um, are particularly disrupted so there can be this um, this neuro neuro reflex response, which can cause dizziness, um, some nausea, unsteadiness, um, and there's often an inflammatory response. Um, so assessment um, symptoms may take up to twelve hours to appear, um, sometimes a couple of days, and then typically worsen for a few days. Um, how do we assess it? Well, we tend to ask a few more questions if it's a whiplash injury, because our notes can be sort of sent to medical legal um, agencies and we can get asked for our notes to be to be um, to be shared. Uh, so we tend to go into a little bit more detail of our case history. Um, we would obviously discuss the onset. Um, we would look at aggravating and relieving factors. We would find out if the patient was wearing a seatbelt. We'd find out if they were driver passenger. We'd discuss the impact of the injury, side impact, rear end impact. We'd ask when the symptoms came on. We'd ask um, any red flags. So we would want to know red flags such as headaches, um, double vision, blurred vision, drop attacks, dizziness, um, nausea, nystagmus, um, um, uh, uh, vertigo, dysphagia, dysarthria. Um, you know, any sort of altered eye movements, um, they're kind of key red flags. Bilateral nerve pains down the arms is another red flag. And um, we would want to exclude a stroke or cervical artery dis dis uh, dissection. Obviously, that, that, that would be a major trauma. And that would probably be, um, be presenting in A&E, not, not with us. That would be an ambulance job. But um, I've never seen one. Uh, but we'd obviously want to rule out the, you know, the nausea, nystagmus, um, sort of um, bilateral nerve pain type symptom, uh, symptom picture. Um, we'd want to exclude uh, fracture and cervical myelopathy. So obviously fracture would be from a high speed in, uh, incident or if they're particularly osteoporotic. Certainly um, be wary of an upper cervical fracture like an odonto peg um, with the particularly with the elderly. Um, and you'd uh, just be wary in, in the elderly with cervical myelopathy or spinal canal stenosis. So there may be some natural narrowing of the spinal canal, um, which then can be exacerbated um, and cause bilateral neurological symptoms, which can progressively worsen. Uh, three quarters of patients um, with whiplash 
present with some form of sensory motor impairment. A third of patients will report, um, will, will report this. So a, a third of neck pain patients will also report this. Um, so there's a number of assessments we can do. Um, the first would be, I mean, obviously when we assess the neck, we'll probably do an active range of movement. So rotation, side flexion, flexion, extension, possibly extension with side flexion. Uh, and then we might um, also look at um, some more advanced tests. So these are kind of tests for stability and strength and also for sensory motor impairment. Um, so we might look at the deep cervical uh, flexor test. So the deep cervical neck flexor test um, is essentially you lie flat on your back. Um, you then um, tuck your chin down and you lift the, uh, the head about five or six few centimeters off the bed okay and you hold that now um here's the test here so you'd look for males to hold this for around about 40 seconds females to hold it for 30 seconds now if your patient cannot hold their neck in a tucked position off the bed and it's quite hard work it's it's quite hard you really feel it in the neck especially after sort of 30 40 seconds but you can hang on um you know, a, a healthy neck could probably easily do a minute um, and, and a conditioned neck would probably go for a minute and a half, two minutes plus. But if you're struggling to go 40 seconds or it's painful, so you can't manage to hold that neck for 40 seconds for a male or 30 seconds for a female, then that's a good sign that you've got neck flexor weakness. You can also do exactly the same for deep extensor muscles. So you can lie on your front and you can extend the neck. Um, or actually, you can actually have your head off the end of a, off the end of a plinth as well. Um, and so you just hold the neck in that position and you're looking for a similar sort of um, time length of maintaining that neck stability. Um, then you've got the cervical joint position error. Now, the cool thing about the cervical joint position error test is it's basically a proprioception test. Um, now, we might not have a laser at hand. They're really hard to get hold of. Um, I've got one here somewhere let me just find mine can everyone still see me or is it um, is it on the actual screen can you just see the screen or can you see me as well let me see if i can show you um stop screen sharing uh, so use one of these which is the um which is the cervical um which is the the, the laser pen if you haven't got one of these and um, they're really hard to get hold of um, you can actually just get a laser pen and just get like a uh, like a like a cycle helmet you can actually stick these on if you particularly wanted to use these tests Actually, do you know what? They're not massively important if you don't want to use them. There are other tests you can use, uh, but this is a very cool um, piece of device, um, which will which can um, be worn on the head. Okay, you stick it on the head, and then what you do is you close your eyes. So first of all, you, you pick a spot on the wall directly in front of you. Um, you can use a like a like a target as well. Some people use a target, um, and you essentially um, you close your eyes, you rotate your neck three times, and you try and bring your laser pen or your eyes right back to the spot where you started now what's really interesting is a normal healthy neck will get pretty close you know probably within a couple of centimeters anything up to five centimeters is normal but over 6.5 centimeters away from the target where you started the middle point where you started would be a positive test for a loss of joint position error um, so that's a sensory motor finding that you've lost that proprioception in your neck, which is particularly common following both neck pain and whiplash. Um, the next test is a smooth pursuit test. So you can use like a tune, uh, you know, you often use a tuning fork or use a finger um, and the patient will um, basically keep their, uh, their, their neck straight, so that their head straight. Um, you're going to move the object sort of around 30 degrees um, each side of their, their, in their field of vision um, in quite a smooth way. And they're going to follow it with their eyes. Okay. So they're just going to look 
right and left as you move the um, the finger um, across their field of vision. Um, and what you're looking for is, is, you know, them starting to get a bit dizzy, they're feeling some pain, they're just feeling like they're, they're, um, they're struggling with it. The eyes start sort of struggling with it or feeling a bit achy. Um, and this is this is an ocular, ocular motor test. So it's, it's, it's showing, again, sensory motor impairment, um, which we find after neck pain and... Um, um, and um, whiplash. Now, I think it was a researcher called Joel who then discovered that if you do the sensory motor um, smooth pursuit test, but you do it with your neck torsioned, so you basically, you rotate your body 45 degrees. So your neck stays where it is, and essentially your, your, your torso is rotated 45 degrees. Your neck is effectively in a cervical rotation, but you're not getting the neck to twist. Okay, so you're putting like a like a, 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 a sort of you're actually cervically rotating, but you're actually turning from the torso, um, and then you do the, the the same exercise. You follow 30 degrees, so the eyes follow um, the the finger or the tuning fork, um, and again you're looking for similar sort of symptoms. You know, um, dizziness, uh, eyes feeling strained, or eyes moving in slightly odd directions. Um, uh, feeling like they're getting a headache or feeling them in pain, anything like that is, is a positive test. And what they found was when the neck is torsioned, you're more likely to get a positive result with this test, indicating that the symptoms of, of dizziness, um, um, the, the, the um, dizziness or, or eye aching or anything like that is usually is, is coming from the neck. So if you do these tests together and the cervical torsion test is positive, that really indicates that this is a neck problem causing causing the symptoms uh, then we've got the um, gaze stability test so this is really really similar except this time you're going to focus on the objects like chin and fork and you're just going to rotate the neck left and right okay and you're going to keep focused on that object and if patients sort of feel like they need help with it need support there's an onset of pain dizziness increased effort and um, that again suggests sensory motor impairment. Now, if you're finding these sensory motor tests are positive, then this is this definitely leads you towards sensory motor rehabilitation. But I've also found sensory motor rehabilitation particularly useful with chronic neck pain patients as well, especially those neck pain patients. Putting whiplash aside, it's especially true of those neck pain patients where um, I can see you good, great, where um, they're really, really sensitized. So you know those really acute necks that have been going on for, like they seem to be really acute on chronic um, and patients are really apprehensive to move their neck. So they're really guarded with a lot of spasm. Then these sort of sensory motor rehabilitation exercises are really, really useful. And you've got the Quebec Task Force um, classification of neck um, of graded whiplashes. So grade zero um, is normal, no pain, no neck complaints, no signs, no symptoms. Um, grade one whiplash would be um, complaint of pain, stiffness, or tenderness, but but no signs. Um, grade two, complaint of, of neck pain, stiffness, but also reduced range of movement, um, point tenderness. Um, stage three whiplash will be um, complaining of pain, stiffness, or tenderness, and neurological signs. Um, it could be tendon reflex, could be um, sensory pain down the arm, pins and needles down the arm. Um, and a grade four would be pain with a fracture or dislocation of the neck. Now, psycho psychosocial psychological aspects. So we know that there's a subgroup of patients that have very poor outcomes. Um, why is that? I got asked this question at Therapy Live um, a week ago. Um, I think there's a strong element of um, um, anxiety and stress associated with whiplashes and i think there's a strong element of um, a medical legal claim with whiplashes um, we definitely know that there's a much higher prevalence of um, whiplashes in low speed car accidents compared to bumper cars so when people are on fun fairs i don't know if you guys have been on fun fair and been on bumper car but i've had my neck whiplashed hard on a bumper car a couple of times and um, yet yeah, because you're having fun 
and it's like a bumper car. They don't, you don't seem to get whiplashes while in bumper car um, impacts, yet you do with really low speed road traffic accidents. I think because there's this anxiety associated because your car's damaged, there's that stressful aspect of it. Um, it, it it's not, um, it, it's, a, it's, that's what tends to cause this sort of psychological sort of aspect of it. And there's also this pain hypervigilance. So we know that patients sort of get really guarded on their pain. Um, there's a lot of anxiety associated with it and there's a link with depression um, and this is often linked with sort of chronic um, pain following whiplash so you, you're greater than 12 weeks and um, there's also this fear of movement and we see this a lot don't we this patients you know when you examine them they're, 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 little, they're like this they barely want to ro uh, rotate their neck and then you know you'll see them walk out of the room and they'll look like over their shoulder because when they're not thinking about it, they can actually rotate their neck. But when they think about it and you ask them to exa and you examine it, they've got this stiffness. I sometimes wonder whether there's, there's, there's that element of, of wanting to look like you've got a stiff neck as well if there's a, if there's a medical legal claim going through. Um, we also see that adherence to home exercises is poor. Um, why is that? I think sometimes that we overprescribe exercises. So we give too many. We know any more than two exercises and adherence starts to reduce. So try and avoid being that physio that prescribes sort of 10, 15, 20 plus exercises because adherence is known to be poor with whiplash. Um, we also, I suspect also adherence can be poor due to overcomplicated exercises being prescribed, especially complicated nerve flosses, nerve glides, things like that. Um, we know there's like a post-traumatic stress element to this so you can get nightmares flashbacks um patients getting migraines irritable jumpy nervous anxious um and there's also a bit of a sensitization effect as well so patients can have pain in multiple body parts if they do have sensitization and pain in multiple body parts it tends to make them much harder to treat so they tend to have more chronic pain um Behavioural approaches are recommended and referral to CBT psychologist or pain clinic is recommended. Um, but as a physio, I think we can do really well with motivating our patients. Now, what's really cool about next? So we want to look at functional movements that we do. What sort of functional movements will we do? Well, we might smell something. So we might just um, protract our neck forwards. So we might smell the coffee or smell some flowers. We might wash our hair into extension we might look left and right as we're crossing a road so we might be walking and looking left and right we might stop and look and listen as we tilt our head forwards and to the side we might reverse a car we might be shaving with our neck at a funny angle and um, and so we're looking at functional movements of, of the neck when we start to rehabilitate um, what rehab approaches are there? So as you've would have heard me talk when I did the shoulder talk, there's lots and lots and lots and lots of different rehab approaches. Now I've got my own approach. Um, I'm not going into details about today because I want to focus more on functional rehabilitation, but I've got my own specific where I rehabilitate next. Um, and I'm very happy to, um, to do a, a second talk on that at some point in the future. Um, but what does the evidence suggest? Well, first of all, education. Um, there's a lot of support for education. There's even some support for group exercises and um, reassurance. So motivating our patients, reassuring our patients that, you know, that, 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 that there's no damage to the neck is useful. Um, so it's almost like convincing the patients that the, the injuries they have are not possibly as bad as they think. But that's got to be done pretty carefully but definitely reassuring our patients especially if they're they're, they're over dramatizing the symptoms um pain management um mobilization um with active exercises um neural tissue mobilization if indicated um, improving motor control improving sensory motor control so there's quite a lot of uh, talk about sensory motor control um and chris uh, chris bases his research on others as well who talk about sensory motor control um, and obviously be aware some won't respond and um, the passive approach so the passive approach is what i've done for years and the evidence doesn't stack up against the passive approach 
so the evidence doesn't suggest a passive approach for whiplash is that useful and that is your typical massage mobilization neck stretches manual therapy electrotherapy acupuncture um, it does tend to stack up in the acute phase but it doesn't tend to stack up in the uh in the chronic phase um so there's mixed evidence on it um, there's definitely stronger evidence supporting a rehabilitation approach and exercise approach um, and chris himself says we probably want to get a little bit further away from the manual therapy approach and more onto the exercise supported approach but i think a combination of both can also be super useful especially if you need to match patient expectation um good so functional task-based approaches um so probably we'll start to reduce reliance on on passive modalities and start to encourage patients to um, uh, recover themselves through active exercise and um, there's some um links with neurological rehabilitation and this cortical plasticity and um, so sort of re-education um, neurological re-education um and building a strong therapeutic relationship with the patient is good. I guess it's what we always say about building that likability factor, um, supporting your patients, um, empathy, listening, shared goals, trust. And that's a really interesting thing that why sometimes research breaks down on, on manual therapy, because what they miss is they, they miss that patient practitioner interaction. As I get very good results with, with treating with plush with manual therapy, um, but I have that relationship with my patient and, you know, and, and, and when you research that, you, you, you don't have that practitioner patient relationship, the, the listening, the empathy, the encouragement of the motivation, the, the chatting, the, 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 the manual therapy, the electrotherapy, the exercises is all packaged into one that helps our patients. So let's talk about functional rehab. So these are all Chris's exercises and they're really, really good. Um, and the really cool thing is they are all on rehab my patient so um, they come under neck sensory motor if you're looking for them they're super easy to do and patients do get them um, so the first one th there's lots i've just picked out some of the sort of sort of the, the really good ones um is the mirror um so essentially what you're doing is you are um keeping your neck straight and you're going to rotate your body around in 180 degrees so you're set effectively you're kind of you're mobilizing your neck without without actively turning your but actively rotating your cervical spine so you're 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 rotating your thoracic spine under your cervical spine very much like a golfer would do with a golf swing and um, the pedestrian so this is a similar thing um, where you'll be walking and you'll just be turning your shoulders left and right so you're rotating the thoracic spine um, under your neck again um, as you're walking um, and then you've got the walk past rotation so this will be like you're walking down a street and you see something in a shop you look at that something but you keep on walking um, and that's the so you, you, you're rotating as you're walking so you're, as you're walking further you're sort of rotating more um, crossing a road so super functionally important we typically look left and right before we cross um, and some of us might look left and right as we're crossing so you're walking and you're rotating the neck um, similar to the previous exercise like the pedestrian but with the pedestrian you keep your neck straight um, and you're rotating the thoracic spine with the crossing the road you're keeping your thoracic spine straight and you're rotating your neck left and right as you walk um, cross over the road with a step so the idea behind this is you'll cross the road and step up onto the curb um, and as you step up, you, you might be looking left and right to see sort of any pedestrians coming along the pavement. Um, the sit and reach. So you might reach forwards to, to, to grab something if somebody passes you something. So you're going to reach forwards. And as you do that, you extend and retract. Um, you, you, extend and retra uh, you, you extend and protract the neck. Um, washing your hair into flexion or washing your hair into extension. Something that we all do. And yet we can actually give an exercise to reproduce the movement and um, to allow us to do it um, avoiding it. So if something comes towards you quite quickly, you might just 
just sort of move out of the way. So it's a sudden, it's a sort of controlled but sudden retraction of the neck. Um, walk past extension. So it might be you're walking along, but you're actually looking at something up in the sky. It might be looking at a plane going by, you're looking at, you know, a big tree, or you're looking at what the weather's doing, or looking at some sort of cloud formation, but you're walking and you're looking up. Um, it's super important to encourage extension. I think it's really useful for the facet joints. Um, and I think we generally lack extension in our necks. Um, same thing with a step. So it makes it more functional. You're going to walk, extend as we step. Um, and then, of course, you've got resistance exercises. You can use a band. Um, you can use a towel. You put a towel around the head and you're just resistant to the towel. Um, or you can use a band, fair band, um, to create some tension as you go. You can just use a hand as well to create an isometric tension. Um, um, but resistant exercises um, can be useful for, for strengthening. And then you've got your sensory motor exercises. So these are the ones which help you rehabilitate if the sensory motor function is reduced. So if we know that our joint position sensors out or they're getting dizziness or they're getting um, getting unsteadiness or anything like that, then, then we probably want to use the sensory motor rehab as well. But it's also really, really good when they're really acute and really nervous. Um, so you've got smooth pursuit, which is face, face, these are all based on the, on the test as well. So you've got smooth pursuit. Um, so essentially you hold your own hand out um, and you're going to keep your head straight and you're going to follow the, um, it's hard to talk and uh, do the exercise at the same time. You're going to follow the, keep neck straight. You're going to follow with your eyes, your thumb. Okay. Um, and then you've got, exactly the same move exactly the same thing but gay stability so actually this time what you do is you keep your your thumb straight but you're going to keep your eyes on your thumb and rotate your neck and the cool thing about that is that it kind of confuses your nervous system a bit because your eyes are focused on the thumb you kind of can start to rotate and get movement in your neck without you without patients feeling particularly anxious about it and um, you've got laser pen exercises so you can Ask your patient to buy one of these, stick it on your head, um, you know, stick it on a psych helmet um, and practice s smooth controlled movements of tracing a circle or tracing a map or drawing the alphabet. And these fine small uh, movements can be really useful for, um, for fine motor control and, and encouraging those muscle spindles to send that this, this sort of this joint position sense um, back to the brain. Good. Um, well, that concludes my talk. So I'm happy to open any uh, questions. There's some good resources on Physiopedia, obviously on Rehab My Patient and chriswersfold.com. Um, and if anyone wants a copy of this, just message me and um, I'll probably upload this to the internet as well. So there's some references there for people who want it. Um, and the research paper that I mentioned uh, here is, is absolutely excellent. Um, so... If, is there any um, questions? Uh, who is that? Is that me asking myself? Um, well, as I said during the first part of the talk, um, these are very hard to get. Um, and the best way to get them is to order a laser pen um, and just, just buy one offline, buy one on eBay. Um, and just attach it to a cycle helmet because you can't really get hold of these very easily. Any questions? Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, final opportunity to ask any questions? Thanks. You're welcome, Chris. Good. Okay. Thanks, Kamal. Cheers, Toby. All right, guys. Well, good to speak to you. And we'll do another talk in two weeks, I think. Thanks. Um, thanks, Kamal. Um, thanks, uh, um, Suelen. I think what we'll do is, I think Chris is going to um, try and organise a, a chat in a couple of weeks. And I know as well, I think, Kamal, you're, you're, you're quite interested in doing a, um, a talk maybe with, with Sam, aren't you, on, um, uh, thank, thanks, Antonio, on, um, on um, calf and, and vascular changes in the calf. So um, hopefully we can start to, um, maybe, maybe in a few weeks we can do that as well. Um, thanks, Jared. All right, guys, take care and we'll see you soon.